I think we are, the door's shut. Um, good afternoon, welcome to this. Um, my name's Kieran Tyler. Um, this talk is clearly not about me, it's about the man to my left, to your right, Bob Stanley. Um, before I get into explaining what my take on Bob is, um, just say how this is going to work. It's programmed for an hour, um, and we're just after two now. Um, we're going to try and do a conversation between the pair of ourselves, which I hope will um, address some of the questions you might have about Bob and his work. Uh, that'll be 40, 45 minutes, so we can have about 15, 20 minutes at the end, depending on how it goes for questions. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got anything you want to say, any questions at the end, of course, please do ask them as well. Uh, one of the drivers for this, apart from Bob being well known both as a writer and a musician in the UK with the band Saint Etienne, is that Bob has just towards the end of last year published this, which is his first book, which is called Yeah, 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 The Story of Modern Pop. And it is literally, inside a cover, the entire story, the entire history of modern pop since the British charts began. Uh, it's the pop era, um, and it's Bob's interpretation on it. It's not an encyclopedia, it's not necessarily a guidebook, it's his take on pop. Um, I first came across Bob in the early 90s in the queue to a record sale. He was either behind me or in front of me, I can't remember which. But, we've, but um, I'll, I'll, clum, I'll come clean, yes, we've known each other for over 20 years. The, as I say, the driver for the talk is not necessarily the fact that he's in... Saint Etienne, who are still a going co concern, but they have layovers and laybys every now and then, but more the book. And it will come out in this what Bob's take on pop is and a vast knowledge of the history of popular music. But one of the things um, I think we, both of us have to recognize here that this actually is a music biz event. Um, so we'd like to also draw out Bob's idea of his journey through the world of pop. Um, St. Etienne started on the British independent label Heavenly. Um, they've been through a number of other labels. Um, they were on Creation Records at the same time as Oasis took off, and they were on Creation Records at the same time that the label's boss, Alan McGee, sold a stake in the label to Sony. After that, they had their records released by Universal. They also had records released by the Beggars Group in the UK, um, they've also had records released in America on sub pop records. So to me, th this, this, this is an opportunity to find out what Bob has learned um, na navigating through this world, different labels, different business models, from the independent to the multinational to the corporate, which I would guess, we'll find out, colours his understanding of what pop music is. And may, I don't know if it's made you cynical or dug into your love of pop music. And would also like to have, um, which, which is very resonant for right now and what's going on in the world not too far from here, um, the nature of being independent and what that might mean these days, because now we have indie music, which is distinct from putting out an independent label. So firstly, before we get to questions, um, welcome to Bob Stanley. So thank you for coming. Um, thank, you for, uh, thank you for having me. So, Bob, what, what, I what is independent music these days? Uh, well, independent music for me has always meant music that's released on an independent label. Um, when you think back to the first independent charts published in Sounds and NME in the very late seventies, early eighties, um, and they were, you know, the, the music was a complete mixture. I remember the first NME chart I think had like James Blood Ulmer, who was like a jazz saxophonist in it, and uh, as well as Cabaret Voltaire and. Uh, Spiz Energy were number one. Um, so this is it was music that was like it, it's, it sounded independent of uh, mainstream chart music, but also most importantly, it was released on an independent label through this network of uh, uh, distributors in Britain, about half a dozen of them. Um, and I th it's uh, it's it's a completely separate thing from indie, which um, I think indie is a term. The first the first I've come across it was. Um, as describing the music was a review of Modern English who were on 4AD in a 1981 review where they were described as having an indie sound which, um, I don't know, distorted guitars, 
quite morose vocal. Um, that was modern English. Uh, but I think as the 80s progressed, in, indie did become a genre. And obviously now, indie, when you say indie, no one thinks about distribution uh, at all. People will just think it, it'll it be a guitar band with a maybe a slightly sort of a soft vocal sound or a, uh, or an indie rock group would sound a bit like, uh, I don't know, post-grunge. Uh, but it's, 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 it's nothing to do with the distribution anymore. Um, so I think indie and independent are really two two separate terms. And I think St Etienne is an independent group rather than an indie group. When when you've been through this uh, run of people releasing your records rather than necessarily being signed to a label, um, what what is what is the business model there? When when you started on Heavenly and more recently your things have been released by Universal, is what what are the differences? And um, have, have you have you picked up things as well which have had to change um, how you dance with business? Yeah, well, we started off. The first record we put out was me and Pete recorded a song. We were quite pleased with it. Um, I knew Jeff Barrett, who was a press officer and a gig promoter in London, and I wanted to see what he thought of it. So I played it to him on a Walkman in a pub in Shepherd's Bush. And so he sat there nodding his head for like four and a half minutes and then said, I'm starting a label called Heavenly, can I release this? So I was like, yeah, of course you can, that'd be fantastic. Um, so it's very, very DIY. Um, and any, mo any money that got split was a 50-50 profit split, which to me is the, that's the classic independent setup. And I think anything else is pr probably not truly independent. Is is that 50-50 split after all the costs of manufacturing, distributing the record are recouped? Yeah, yeah. So we never saw a penny, but <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know, theoretically, if it made money, it would have been a 50-50 profit split. Uh, but that, that became a, 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 a big deal when um, we were on creation, which, again, it was a 50-50 profit split. But uh, they, 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 so, they sold, sold out to, well, sold out, sold up to Sony, uh, and of course, from that point on, it wasn't a 50-50 profit split anymore. It was 18% uh, or whatever. What, were you actually signed to Creation? Was was there a piece of paper that was your contract with Creation? I don't think we ever had a... No, I don't think we had a contract since we signed to Beggar's Banquet. I think that was the first... Uh, oh, well, outside of, outside of Britain, we were on Warner Brothers right from the word go, um, which suited us really well because... All the artwork originated in Britain, all the production remixes um, were all down to us. And really, I think it's just the most important thing about being independent was to retain control of artwork. Um, we wanted to put sleeve notes on our albums, which was quite unusual in the early 90s. I think it was seen as a bit old-fashioned. Um, but we wanted to do that. We thought it was important to package the record the packaging to me was just as important as what was inside it. It was all part of the that was all part of the same thing. Um, so it's important to us that we we originated that, and then Warner Brothers had to use our artwork. And if they didn't use our artwork, which they didn't a couple of times, it ne nearly always looked terrible. And then we could obviously dismiss it as well. That's what happens when a major label <laughs> gets hold of it. They don't really understand what they're doing. So um, we had the best of both worlds in that respect. Um, you, you talked about the aesthetics of the package overall there. Um, does does that mean that you were, I suppose metaphorically speaking, does that mean you were all sitting at your kitchen tables working out what the covers and what the records should look like? And, and even that, in, down, down to what level? Down to the labels? Down to the inner sleeves? Um, yeah, it really was. Um, we couldn't do the layout on a computer ourselves, but short of that, I mean, the first album... I took the photo. <coughs> um, I took the photo on the cover of Fox Base Alpha, and uh, to look more professional, we credited it to somebody else because we didn't want to look like we're rank amateurs. Um, but yeah, the, even the fonts on the on the covers, every everything was, we, you know, we just knew exactly what we wanted it to look like. And um, as as time went by, uh, and we we met Paul Kelly, who designed most of our recent. Our art, well, recent, our artwork from the last 15 years. Um, we worked with him and we trust his instincts. So it's, you know, it's not always 
device by us now, but it certainly was in the early days. But I'm, I'm sure I'm sure to 99.999% of us in this room now, we, we know what, we have an idea visually, and I suppose musically as well, what the Saint Etienne aesthetic is, or what, or what a Saint Etienne record is going to look like. Um, but that doesn't just apply to your own releases, does it? You've uh, released records by other artists on labels which you've run, but you've also done reissues which are, well, I suppose, branded as St. Etienne products. So is, is there any, ever, any ev argument ever about um, how what St. Etienne is is put out to other bands or other releases? What, internally in the group, is there any argument? In, in, internally in the group, or, e or even... Um, if, if, say, during the period when you were licensed to Universal and a Saint Etienne presents the trip compilation, hugely influential compilation, comes out, do, do the lords and masters of the international corporate label say, no, 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 you're, you're with us? Did you, have you always had that freedom? But also, of course, within the band. Um, well, doing that compilation, we had slightly less freedom than we would have done if we just devised it ourselves because... Uh, Universal had uh, set artwork for the, the... The trip was part of a series. There was about seven or eight different compilations called The Trip, all compiled by different people. And they all had the same artwork, which was quite ugly, but uh, um, we wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. So you, know, you have to compromise a little. Um, and, but the, the track listing was exactly as we wanted it, and we mixed it ourselves. Um, so, yeah, no, there wasn't really any argument there. I think... Um, on that compilation, one disc was more what Pete chose, and the other one was what I chose, and uh, Sarah came up with four or five suggestions, which we just mixed into the middle. Um, no, there's never really been any... any it's, it's a bit sickening, really. We all get, we all get on pretty well. Um, never really had any <laughs> major arguments. Um, we, got a bit, we got a bit tired of each other in the mid-'90s and took a break, and uh, if we hadn't done that, maybe we wouldn't still be doing stuff now. But So that was a, a wise thing to do, I think. But no, there's, there's never really been any argument about the content of the reissues. Um, I'm, I'm slightly bossier than the other two, to be honest, and so uh, uh, some of them are just pretty much my, my compilations and with the band name on. But um, Pete could do the same as well if he wants. It's pretty democratic. And t turning it back to when you were on creation during the rise of Oasis, and we're not... Um, Actually, there's something I should add here, which I should have said at the beginning. Um, if anybody wants to buy Bob's book, I have some homemade vouchers where you can buy it from the publisher and get 30% off the price. And this is in the EU here, so the postage wouldn't be very expensive. But um, we haven't put these on the Italian Music Week website, because if you put something 30% off Bob Stanley's book, it'll probably get the special promotion code shut down by the publishers immediately. So if anyone does actually want to buy it, ask me, and I can, I can give you a piece of paper with the secret information on it. But one of the other interesting things about this gentleman is, um, my understanding is uh, the first time you popped your head out to the world as a pop music person was by putting out your own fanzine. And then you ended up writing for the weekly music paper Melody Maker. I don't know if that's a seamless thing. But throughout this whole process, Bob has, throughout the whole process of St. Etienne, all sorts of other things, has actually continued to write, not just about music, um, which I've, I've had a reasonably hard think about this. And the, the people like Neil Tennant of the Pet Shop Boys who wrote for the Enemy in the 70s and famously reviewed an early Sex Pistols show, or Chrissy Hind who wrote for the Enemy even earlier in the 70s. And there's a few others. And you get writers like Nick Kent or Lester Bangs in America who sort of have half-hearted hobby-type bands. But throughout this whole thing, you have continued to write. So one thing I'd like to know is, was that a conscious decision not to stop writing? Uh, but a sub-question to that is, yes, you'll continue writing about music, other people's music at a point when your own records are in the charts. Did that ever create any sticky situations for you with anything you wrote about? But why did you continue writing? Um, I continued writing because I really liked writing about music. I think that was what I always wanted to do from when I was 12, 13 years old. Um, and I never saw myself being in, a, being in a group because I never learned to play an instrument. 
Um, I had a go at playing the guitar. I had a go at playing the clarinet. And I bought a Korg MS-10 when I was about 16. What, what's a Korg MS-10? Um, an analog keyboard. Um, it's the same one. Juan Atkins bought one about the same time, and then he went off and invented techno, but I couldn't get more than fuzzy noises that sounded terrible out of my one, so uh, I, I really didn't persevere with that. So it wasn't until sampling came along that I had... Um, I thought I could actually do something here. I've got a record collection. I've got I've got friends who can sing. I could go in the studio and um, try and do something that sounds like Bomb the Bass or S Express. They were kind of my role models. Um, and so that's what we did. And at the third attempt, we did Only Love Can Break Your Heart, which is the record that Jeff Barrett issued in 1990. Um, so, but I, I, primarily, I'm a, I'm a fan. And, I, I you know... I love pretty much everything about pop music. I'm, all, I'm always being reminded by just like reading, reading something on a blog or uh, watching a documentary of why, why I love pop music so much. And so writing about it is, is really important to me. Um, you can't get everything across that you feel in a lyric. It's, it's a completely different thing. But, but is writing about it a form of um, re refreshing your memory and making yourself enthusiastic again if um, you've been up against the mill in something else? Yeah, uh, yeah I suppose it can be, yeah. If, it, if, it, if it's, yeah, dipping outside of the... Uh, um, I mean, to be honest, when, when we were actually selling a reasonable number of records, I, I didn't write very much because I was just too busy. Uh, so it's probably like a sort of two-year period where... All I wrote about was in our sort of fan club newsletter. <laughs> uh, I wrote about, did reviews of things and that, but um, I didn't really have the time to. Uh, I did the occasional thing for the face. I remember um, piece about girl groups, but it wasn't wasn't that regular. Um, but no, I think you're probably right. It definitely like rekindles my enthusiasm um, and make, reminds me why 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 I wanted to make records and write songs in the first place. Definitely, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it's um, also, while I was writing the book, it occurred to me that a lot of my favourite musicians are, are basically fans as well. Um, someone like Roy Wood or Adam Ant, where when they, when they started having hits, they, they thought, well, you know, now's my opportunity to make a record, or in Roy Wood's case, make a record that sounds like Neil Sedaka on the first verse and then the Beach Boys on the second verse, and see if anyone notices, and it's still got in the top ten. Um, Adam Ant obviously got lots of lots of people he really admired in his in his videos. Um, also, like the fact with Adam Ant that the Sex Pistols' first ever show, I think you might correct me here, was supporting his band Bazooka Joe, and he sort he sort of yes, at that's Saint right. Martin's it? College. Oh, yeah. good. Um, and um, he was so impressed by the Sex Pistols, he immediately split his group up and started a new one. So, uh, you know, they're, they're the people I, I I can relate to the most, I suppose. Um, and you know they're, they're they're fans. They make they make records because they're pop fans. It's you know they can be on both sides of the fence. But what what about people who are fans of technical prowess, um, difficult keyboard parts, difficult guitar parts? Does it, does any of that sort of stuff appeal to you? Um, no, not well. Certainly not for the sake of it. Um, I mean, I, I I can admire. I remember like God, twenty years ago now, going to. Uh, the 12 Bar Club on Denmark Street, which is a tiny little club that holds about 50 people, and Bert Jansch was doing a um, a month of uh, a month of gigs there um, at a point where people weren't really that interested in him, I suppose. So he could play in this tiny place, and it wasn't even full. Um, so I could sit right in front of Bert Jansch, watching him play the guitar, and just thinking, I have absolutely no idea how you can do that. It sounds incredible. It sounds like three guitars at the same time. You're an absolute genius, uh, and it sounds great. Um, so it's not that I don't admire great musicians, but technical prowess for the sake of it, and I suppose then I'm thinking of a lot of maybe metal guitarists or someone like Eric Clapton. Um, I don't really get it, and I don't. It's, it's just not my thing. I can understand why, especially if you're a musician, which I, I don't really think of myself as a musician. But if you're a musician, then you're looking up to someone who's technically uh, better than you are, I suppose. Um, I probably like writers who are technically better than I am. Uh, I, I definitely like writers that I'll, I'll show something to my girlfriend. She goes, "I don't know what you see in this, really." Uh, so maybe it's the same kind of thing as that. And have you ever sat down with a record of somebody's body of work 
and actually tried to work out why you don't like it and it's something that lots and lots of people like and you've gone, I still don't get this. Like, have, have, you, have you sat down with the entire canon of Eric Clapton from the Yardbirds, John Mayall, whatever onwards? And I should come clean here, I wrote an article for The Guardian about why I hate Eric Clapton. But um, I, I did, yes, yes. It was like, it's called something like Eric Clapton is not God or something like that. But have, have you ever actually done that sort of exercise to try and understand something that you don't, didn't previously understand? Yeah, absolutely. I think I sometimes think the reason I listen to music is different to a lot of people. I, I really like to hear anything that got in the chart, anything that was a big hit in, well, actually anywhere pretty much in sort of 50s, 60s or 70s, um, maybe even the 80s. I'll, I'll, I'll really want to listen to just to see what it sounds like, but it was just an Australian hit or a whatever, only a hit in Finland. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear it. Um, which is probably not the way people normally listen to music. Um, but uh, sorry, what was the first bit of the question? Of, uh, um, entire Eric Clapton. Oh, yes. He's just yeah. an example. Have, have yeah. you actually sat down, um, let's, let's forget about Eric Clapton, have you ever sat down with the entire Emerson, Lake and Palmer catalogue and tried to figure out what it is about it? Or yeah, of course. Yeah, Who? Definitely, definitely. I mean, well, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Uh, well, when I, when I was writing the book, I thought there's really, really no point in writing a book which is... It's obviously going to have my opinion and my personality in it, but I thought if I if I just take some say country and western, and I'm just very dismissive of it, dismissive because I don't listen to that much country and western, it's not going to be a very enjoyable book, and it's not going to be helpful in any way at all. I think it's um, so I find it really important for me anyway to uh, to try and understand why people like music, even if I don't, and especially with country. And metal. I mean, country metal and hip hop are basically the three biggest pop forms in the world, and have been for a, a long time now. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I really want to understand. I want to understand why um, Garth Brooks has sold almost as many records as Elvis. But so, I, so I don't but get why, that. Why has Garth Brooks sold almost as many records as Elvis? Um, I think in his case, it was because there'd obviously been country rock before Garth Brooks, but he was like rock country, which is maybe a subtle difference. Uh, so it's very hard for British listeners, I think, at any rate, to even hear him as a country musician. But there's... Yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, blend, it was a blend of music that obviously appealed to um, a large part of probably Southern America, I guess. Um, and it hadn't really... Country music hadn't really been done that way before. So in, in a way, he was... Uh, it, there, were, there was uh, Alabama, I think, as well. But it was, it was pretty much... There weren't many people who'd done that before. Uh, I still don't. I still don't like it. I still can't understand how it sold so many millions of copies. But um, that was my understanding of Garth Brooks. Is, is there anything in this self-determined task of yours where you actually set out to understand it for book purposes, where you actually came out and thought, "Ah, I now like something which I'd never even thought about before." Um, mostly, it was the very early stuff in the book, the pre-rock and roll. Um, kind of balladeers and instrumental music. Um, and I had I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew these records had been hits, but I knew the titles. It didn't really mean anything to me. It's people like, uh, well, in Britain, it was uh, people coming out of the big band era, like Lita Rosa and Dickie Valentine. Um, and in America, there would have been Eddie Fisher, who is mainly remembered now if he's remembered at all for being married to Elizabeth Taylor and Debbie Reynolds and Connie Stevens, which is quite impressive, but no one remembers his records, even though he was like the biggest teen idol in America in the early 50s. So that, that was a really interesting period to delve into and to work out why those people were successful and to work out why music sounded the way it did immediately before rock and roll, which had a lot to do with the Second World War, I think, um, and people not wanting any kind of exciting music because... The war had been quite exciting in a very bad way, and they just wanted something that was quite calming and reassuring, and that's what that's what pop music sounded like for the decade after the Second World War, really. Uh, this 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 though is all the past. Are, are you st are you still um, digging out or looking for current things? Does that st still there? Because have have you heard so much and heard everything that you can't take anything else? Um, well, I'd really like to think not. I mean, occasionally I'll, I'll hear something and think it sounds 
terrific, but I'm not really keeping up as much as I should. I mean, I I I really need to work out some way of uh, having a list of like a dozen blogs that I look at, and uh, they keep me informed. There's like there's a couple. Dummy, I think, is good in Britain. Um, and anything they recommend, I'll, I'll give a listen to. Uh, but I mean, coming to a place like this is really eye-opening because you realise how much how much more music there is that you're not going to read about in the British or American press or British and American blogs, and you really have to seek out yourself. Um, and it's really quite galling that I've got to go home almost straight after this because I'm not going to get to see very much. But um, um, this. The, the, the thing that's different now, I think, compared to the era I'm writing about in the book, which is basically 50 years from 1950 to the year 2000, um, is that there's so much more choice now and there's such a lack of consensus on uh, where music's going, um, like a sense of direction, I suppose. Uh, and that was something I, I grew up with and I find, I find it quite hard not to have... Uh, a sense of progression it's quite scattershot and there's a lot of good music being made but it's it's very hard to join the dots I suppose is what I'm saying but is, is there actually any need to join the dots anymore is, is this, well, no, there, there how, is this how it's going to be for the future oh yeah I'm sure it is but I'm, I'm 50 so it's like for me to completely relearn how I how I discover music or in what conditions I should listen to it it's quite difficult um, I, I, I'm a record collector, vinyl collector, I suppose even in the CD era I was finding it quite odd that I couldn't just go down to the shop and buy the new Beyonce single or whatever um, because it didn't exist. It was just a download. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, um, that's something I've got, to, I've got to work out for myself, I think. It's definitely not a bad thing. It's just, it's just different. It's a very, very different way of uh, absorbing music, I think, and discovering new music. What what do you stick on at home for fun? Oh God, um, all kinds. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What what do I put on? Uh, I like to listen to the Monkeys in the morning. John Fahey and Gene Clark in the evening. I don't know. Matching Mole. I've been listening to a lot recently. Um, lots of things. Your path. I don't like the word journey because it's everywhere these days, but your path through this, these, these myriad of record labels, um, is, is there one particular organisation who put out your records, and we did talk earlier about the nature of actually being signed to a label or licensing your records to a label for a limited period, but is there one particular imprint or record house that you were with that um, you actually like best? out of all the places you've been on? And why, if there is? Uh, well, Heavenly and Creation were both pretty exciting places to be just because of the other people on the labels at the time. I mean, so if I went to the Creation office, who'd be there hanging out? Members of Primal Scream, the Boo Radleys. Uh, there'd be there's this guy, Chris Abbott, who was, had his own dance label which was quite short lived I think so there, there was always something to, new to listen to and someone new to meet um, and also the the possibility that what you were listening to if you thought it sounded good was almost certainly going to sell and become a hit um, which again I find quite hard now as if I go and see a band I think well that, they were great um, it, there's, no, there's no the structure that was there in the 90s of um, putting on a gig, getting an agent, getting a press officer, um, putting out your first single and it, it gets in the indie charts, second single gets in top 75, third single might go top 20. Um, that's all completely gone. Um, and again, I find, I find that a little, a little bit difficult to uh, come to terms with. It sounds like someone's died, doesn't it? Um, but um, back then, it was, you know, it was very exciting. It was very exciting to know that you were around people who were making... Yeah, you know, properly, properly groundbreaking records like Scream Delica or, or Giant Steps by the Boo Radleys or um, uh, Juan Atkins was signed to the Creations Dance label for a while so I got to meet him and that was really exciting. Um, yeah, that, that was great. That was really good. That's my favourite period. 
What what's your take on and and indeed if it actually survives as the independent label as being the A and R incubator for the majors? Do you th do you think that even still exists? Not really. I think um, if you want to be on an independent label now, that you, you can totally dictate the terms. I suppose even more so than when when we started, because you had to have someone manufacturing and distributing the records, and, and now you really don't. You can do it all yourself. Um, I, no, I mean I, I don't. I don't know if A and R men still go to like indie band. Um, whatever, showcase gigs or in, in sort of back rooms in pubs. I don't know, I don't actually know if that happens so much anymore. It feels like, it doesn't feel like it does, but I might be wrong. Um, it it kind of happens. Stuff stuff comes along where people send you spam type PR emails and tell you to go and see such and such a show because there's an A&R buzz on it. Whether whether that is the case or not, I don't know, but that's how th new some new things come through as marketing. So it's kind yeah, of that just feels like a sort of like hangover from what what was going on before, though. Really, where that would be, you know, people try and cause a buzz, and then it might work or it might not. But but what what drops out of this, though, is the obvious question. Then, why why sign to a label? Then, why do people still want to do it? Do they need to? Um, I suppose if you haven't got confidence in your own ability to get the music out, then it's uh, it's useful. Um, I think it's also always useful to have a good manager because you can't you really can't do absolutely everything yourself. Um and we've had the same manager for a long time. Um Adam McGee was a manager first and then uh, Martin Kelly was his assistant and took over managing us in about ninety four. Um but he's great and we fall out sometimes and we argue, but you know, I know that Basically, he's always going to he's always going to have our interests at heart, which is important. Because a lot of managers probably don't. A lot of managers will um, be thinking primarily themselves. Um, just from my experience, that's how it that's how it seems. In in writing the book, have there been any shocking stories of uh, people out for it themselves that you come up with? Um, well, I suppose that the, the, one of my favourite weird management stories is Malcolm McLaren with Adam and the Ants. It's like I'm obsessed with Adam Ant, don't I? Um, where Adam Ant gave him a thousand pounds to uh, give him some advice on what to do with his band, and what Malcolm McLaren did, which is quite a famous story. This really, what Malcolm McLaren did was to uh, give him a couple of cassettes of Burundi drumming, uh, and then steal his band from him and form Bow Wow Wow. So leaving Adam Ant completely on his own with his two cassettes of Burundi drumming, and so Adam Ant thought, well, actually, you know what? I'm actually going to do something with these. I'm going to form a new band that will have Burundi drumming in it and then he became the biggest pop star in the country, which is a, a great story, I think. And what happened to Bow Wow Wow? They did okay, but not as well as Adam and the Ants. So, so do you think Adam and thought there was a thousand pounds well spent, even <laughs> though his band was... Well, I think that's it. I think he just thought, I'm going to, t I'm going to do the most positive thing I can with this bad situation. Uh, it, was, it was a very impressive thing to do. Are there um, situations where dealing with labels, promoters, booking agents, tour operators or whatever, where y you yourselves, the band, have had to sit down, um, you're obviously going to do something with these people, where you've had to sit down and dictate the terms? Have you, have you had to you know, create a strength around yourself that may not have been there? Uh, yeah, several times. And obviously it doesn't always work. Um, but uh, yeah, we've tried to as much as we can. Um, and if things haven't been working out with like an agent or uh, a press officer, then we've just switched and got a new one. Um, I, I think having been a, having been a having been writing for Enemy and Melody Maker before the band started, it was uh, fairly easy for me to spot a, a lousy press officer for instance of which there, there are quite a few there certainly were then um, who are, are doing like the bare minimum of work and don't really have a grasp on what they could do with your music um, so I, 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 was, I was quite lucky and when you asked earlier if I was cynical I was certainly f pretty cynical when the group started but in a healthy way I think I, I, I was pretty suspicious of <laughs> almost everyone um, whether record companies or management or uh, press officers, um, 
so we built a, a, a team around us which um, has did okay. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a weird one really because having said all this, we've never really had a major hit single. We've never had a worldwide hit album, and maybe if I had hadn't been so uh, obsessive about keeping control of things and handed it over to somebody at Warner Brothers, we might have had a number one in America. I, I really don't know. And then split up immediately because that's what would have happened. But um, I'm quite pleased with the way it turned out. Is is there a tip for people in the, in what you just said in build a team around you? Yes, definitely. Um, starting with management, I think. Um, uh, the label, I mean, you, could, you, you can really do that yourself, especially now you could really do that yourself. Um, and just ask, I think one of the things is to ask people, ask people you know who have done well or who you respect and get tips off them. Um, I mean, the, Be the Beatles were kind of the worst thing that ever happened to pop music in a way because the idea that you're not an authentic group unless you're entirely self-contained and you do everything yourselves and you know best is, it's fine if you're the Beatles, but nobody else is the Beatles. Um, and so it's very easy to make mistakes if you try and, try and do everything yourselves um, without asking anybody else. Um, so yeah, that would be my tip really would just be to... to yeah, you know, it's be brave and ask people. Um, but but what 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 if you're in a place like Estonia, which it's in NATO, it's part of the EU, it has the euro as the currency. Um, my impression of Estonia is, especially with Tallinn Music Week, not only is it about bringing together from Estonia music from things from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, but there's also a drawdown from Finland just across the piece of water um, in that direction. Uh, what about if you're in a place like this where it is potentially quite hard to reach out to the world, and maybe potentially, um, some of you might know this, I mean, I'd, I'd come here at the drop of a hat, um, but it's possibly quite hard to get people to come here to find out. What, what would you say to a place like this who want to be heard? How do they make them that interest? Um, well, I think you make the interest by um, being good, for one thing, um, trying to uh, uh, build up a local... You know, if you're building up a team around you, building up local support is also important. Um, but yeah, you obviously, you have to be good to do that, but... Um, yeah, I, I think you know the the idea that you know you can. I think a lot of, a lot of people you see you see bands playing in London from wherever all over Europe, and they do one gig to um, thirty people in a pub, and uh, no one pays. You know, maybe somebody will like it, but it's, the chances are it will just come and go, and that's it. That that seems really quite tragic, and I think. Unless you've, you know, you need you need the support beneath you, and I think that would have to start. I'd, I guess that would have to start at a local level. I mean, thinking of where we were, um, when I wrote a fanzine, you then got to meet other people who are writing fanzines in Britain. There was this network there, and then if you felt you could, you could step up from there to the next level, do the same thing again. I think if we'd, uh, if I tried to do a fanzine that was distributed by W. H. Smiths, it wouldn't have worked. I suppose maybe that's a comparison. So really, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, try and concentrate in, on becoming successful locally and getting a fan base locally. And uh, so, so learn your lessons, take your knocks, sort it out in your own backyard first, and then think about something else. Of course, that's that's quite a financially prudent way to do it. Yeah, that as well. I mean, otherwise, you, if you if you do if you come to go to London or wherever for one gig, it's going to cost a lot of money as well. Um, and and you'll and you'll be depressed if it doesn't work. And you might split up. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'll definitely sort of build, build it up gradually, um, starting locally. But, but do, you, do you think, though, the internet has actually changed the way that's done? Because the, the cutoff point for your book is pretty much the rampant digitalization of music. But do you think the sticking stuff on, on the internet and finding out that you've got um, 83 trillion Facebook likes from some other country? Um, does that mean it's worth going to that country? Yes. Yeah, I mean that, that's different. Yeah, uh, obviously, because then then you have got the, f the you've got the fan base and you've got the support there. That's uh, that's the same, I think. If you've got that, you know, you've got a lot of likes on Facebook, a lot, you know, mm. especially if it's coming from one place. Then 
someone is almost certainly going to approach you and say, do you want to do this gig? And you won't end up losing loads of money yourself. So, yeah, that, that's that's different. Um, I suppose I was talking about really, really starting from scratch. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's... Well, um, it's kind of fanciful thing that just came out of my mouth, but it can happen. Yeah, so of I, course. Don't, I don't mean on the um, Psy gangman style type novelty thing. I mean, I mean on, like, proper stuff. Mm. Whatever, whatever the hell proper is. But are you, are you quite happy about the future? Do you think music will be continued to be made? Will will your love of music continue? Yes, definitely. You've written a definitely. big fat book. You're Saint Etienne will do an album next year or the year after. Yeah, almost certainly. Um, yeah, of course. It's there's. Yeah, me, pop music's not going to go go anywhere, go away. Um, and people are still going to carry on making it. I mean, uh, yeah, and and I have no idea where it's going next either, which is. Uh, a question that people I don't know I, I think because I've written this people assume I might have a clue what music going to sound like in, in 50 years time and of course I have no idea whatsoever but, but now, now you've written this you're a seer you're a prophet you've, you've written no, you've written I'm a historian you, you've, you've written the manual it's, it's the story of modern pop so in here must contain the tablets from the mountains to tell you how to do it yeah you have to buy it to find out yes it's 30, all in there 30% off now alright um, questions please anybody um on anything for Bob. Come on, somebody must have something to say. Something they need to get off their chest. Gen gentleman there with his hand up. You talk briefly about the label and the role of labels today. And doesn't, doesn't it seem to you that today labels have a kind of turned into curators in a way? Because there is so much of this unsigned music available that someone who forms a certain critic Did, did everybody hear that? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, c can you think of any labels that are doing that at the moment? I'm trying to think of, like, labels where, when I was a teenager, which sounds like a terrible old man thing to say, but, like, Factory or 4AD, where they clearly had a very strong aesthetic, musically and visually. Um, Okay, yeah, 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 Me uh, yeah. I think metal, me metal's really interesting. I mean, again, was writing a book because it really is like a, a parallel universe. It's a, it's completely separate. I mean, occasionally, it will cross over with pop, but um, very rarely. That it, that n n neither side is very, very strongly affected by the other. Um, uh, and yeah, metal will survive. You know, the apocalypse. I think really, and the artwork will still look the same in fifty years. Actually, that's something I can say about music in fifty years. Metal will still be around. Um, yeah, uh, but out, outside of metal, I, I actually, I'd love to know if there are, are labels like that. Um, uh, I, I, you know, even like a label like Domino, which had a very strong aesthetic, I think, a few years ago, with its uh, Americana-leaning stuff, it now has the Arctic Monkeys or whoever, and it's um, that's kind of different. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. I, I don't know them, so. Um. Cap capture tracks is a funny one though, because there can only be so much that can be drawn down into that label that fits with what that label is about. I mean, it's, it seems to me like it's a self-fulfilling proposition towards its own death. But there's a lot of labels that have been like that over. The, you, could, you could have said that about Motown or Sarah Records or something. Presumably, if it's a, if I, I don't, what kind of music is it? So, mo modern shoegazing from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. No, I think what, what I said holds true. Then I think uh, you know, it takes one one group from from the bunch to take take a step forward and do something different, and then the label progresses, or the the, the, the amount it can draw down from will grow, I suppose. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad about that. I didn't know. That. I didn't know that. But what what about the point though that la labels are more curators rather than an imprint because curators in that that to me in your in your point there implies that a label is like somebody who keeps a museum and they're keeping something alive something which is from the past or dead or needs to be curated and preserved it's quite a loaded word curator 
Do you mean curators as in they're, they're not really making money, but they're just bringing things together? Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right then. But I think again, it's um, that's not necessarily a new thing. But I kind of think I think I think that's what Saint Etienne's like, really, because uh, I don't think um, I'd like to think we're 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 pretty. Um, our music's hard to pin down. It comes from a lot of different, a lot of different things we like. But because it's filtered through us and we're writing the lyrics and Sarah's singing the songs, it's going to sound like Saint Etienne, even if it's really varied. So yeah. I think you're right. It's the same same principle, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a new thing. But I'm glad it's still happening. <laughs> um, anyone else? Anything, please? Oh, come on, come on. That's right, you don't have to ask anything. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel don't feel uh, pressured. Well, I think. Is there anything you would like to say to wind up before? Um, I've had a really nice time in Tallinn. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've eaten lots of herring. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, God, I don't know really. Anything I'd like to say? Uh, thanks to you for in interviewing me. And um, oh, I think yeah, pop good. music is not dead. Um, quite quite a few reviews of my book did actually suggest I think it's all over, and that's why I've written it. Um, but the reason I stopped, I finished the book in the year two thousand. Was for for a good reason. I think uh, it's a, you'd, you'd be an absolute idiot to write a, a book about the entire history of music that ended the day before you send it to the publishers, because um, you need you need a bit of distance to have some context. And I do I do think, which not everybody agrees with, but I think the era of um, vinyl records, people communicating by sending fanzines or cassettes or uh, listening to radio shows and taping them. Um, and getting information from music papers, uh, and, and then you end up buying a record without even hearing it because you trust the reviewer. That feels like a, 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 a certain era which is definitely past. And uh, it, was, it was a long era. It was like a 50-year period. But it feels like the, that, the way that people absorb music has changed since the year 2000, since uh, iTunes and since the sort of digital tipping point from analog to digital, I suppose. Um, There's a gentleman at the back in a blue and black shirt with his arm up. Did every did everybody hear that? Okay, okay. That's definitely not my next book. <laughs> um, um, I think yeah, and no, I'm not I'm not sure what it's going to be at the moment. I've I've got a couple of ideas and I'm. Uh, once I've actually got a deal <laughs> for them, I'll, I'll let you know. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to write next. It, it, it won't, it won't be that. Um, that's probably a book for somebody else to write. I'm, I, re I don't, I feel like I'm actually too old to do that now. Um, but uh, I've, yeah, I don't. Know, I think you're, you're right. Maybe it's over. My, my brain writing this book was a bit like emptying my brain onto onto paper, uh, and it's quite a relief to get it out. I felt like it was getting a bit clogged up. Is, is, th is there anything left in your brain bulb? <laughs> no, it's empty. It's gone now. It's that's, all over. That's that's terribly sad. Um, I think uh, your empty brain draws this to a close. Th thank you so much for coming. And I want I want to, um, as as the audience is here, I want to echo what Bob said. It's um it's just a really really great place to be to be in Estonia. So thank you for inviting me here as well. But thank you to Bob. Thank you.